Planes, trains and highways now crisscross Russia. Strains of drug-resistant TB have spread to thousands of citizens. And some are leaving the country. What's dramatically affected the spread of TB is our ability to travel. All the strains that are in the Russian prisons among prisoners will eventually come to our doorstep. The global spread of TB is monitored in New York City at the Public Health Research Institute. On the rise nearly everywhere, TB now rivals AIDS. It claims two to three million lives a year. TB bacteria collected worldwide help researchers chart the evolution of new strains. DNA extracted from the bacteria can be displayed in a barcode pattern, a genetic fingerprint of the enemy for Barry Kreisworth. We've been able to look literally at the DNA from the bacteria, and we use this as a detective story. We can go from bacteria to bacteria, which infect different people, and ask, are these bacteria the same? Are we getting one person who is spreading his or her strain to many others? Based on our fingerprint database, we've actually seen the most prominent strain that is running rampant throughout the Tom's prison already in the U.S. Hi, Betty. What's up? Look at this. Kreisworth shares this grim discovery with Alex Goldfarb. So this is a fingerprint of that 148 strain that we see all over the Tom's prison. It's that multi-drug resistant strain. Look at this one. Same exact pattern. Yes. But this isn't from the prison. This is from a New York patient we received from the Department of Health in New York City. Uh-huh. It's identical. Is he a Russian? Well, this is a Russian mm -hmm. who has MDRTB. So I think it's a nice find, but it's a scary one, too. How long before another traveler carries drug-resistant TB to New York or any other city? How long before others are infected? If an epidemic erupted, most cities would be caught unprepared. Not enough personnel trained to diagnose and treat TB no stockpiles of second-line drugs, and TB is just the tip of the iceberg. The microbes that cause malaria, pneumonia, gonorrhea, and scores of other infectious diseases are also evolving drug resistance. Misuse of antibiotics is one cause. Overuse is another. In the United States, nearly half of all prescriptions are unnecessary or inappropriate. We've created this problem. Multi-drug resistance is a man-made problem. And we do that by putting antibiotics in animal feeds. We have antibiotics running rapidly through hospitals. We have antibiotics in the environment. By developing as many antibiotics as we have over the last 50 years, we've essentially accelerated an evolutionary process. The outcome is that we're going to have more drug-resistant microbes to the point where some of the most dangerous bacteria will not be treatable. We're racing against the microbe every day, and unfortunately, we're losing. It's an arms race without end. The more drugs we launch at microbes, the more resistance they evolve. Maybe it's time to change our strategy. If we can drive microbes to evolve drug resistance, then we can also make them evolve in ways that benefit us. This is the radical proposition of Amherst biologist Paul Ewald. When people are looking at the antibiotic resistance problem, they see evolution as sort of the, the bad guy. It's the evolutionary process that's led to antibiotic resistance, and that's true. But just as easily, we can have evolution being the solution. 
In other words, we can have evolutionary processes leading to um, organisms becoming more mild. Disease organisms evolve to be more or less harmful depending on how they are spread. Microbes that depend on close contact between people tend to be mild. The rhinovirus that causes a common cold is transmitted by people walking around sneezing or coughing on other people. Since it really does depend on fairly healthy people to be transmitted, not surprisingly, it's one of the mildest viruses that we know about. But microbes that are transmitted by insects or by tainted food or water tend to make people very sick. The worst of all of the diarrheal bacteria that we know of have been waterborne. The bacteria that cause cholera and typhoid fever are often waterborne. So even if the organism is so harmful that the sick person can't move from bed, the organism can still be transmitted to large numbers of people. Once we understand the factors that favor increased harmfulness and decreased harmfulness, then we can look at all of the things we do in society. And we can ask the question, are we doing certain things or can we do certain things that would favor organisms evolving towards mildness? We can look at the cholera outbreak in South America as a kind of natural experiment that allows us to evaluate these ideas. In 1991, cholera invaded Peru and spread quickly. Over the next five years, more than one million people were stricken with diarrhea and vomiting, some severely. Over 10,000 people died. The disease was transmitted through water contaminated with human waste, or through food that was washed or handled by infected people. There's a significant margin between the outer... Ewald collected strains of cholera bacteria from South America and measured the amount of toxin they produced, an indication of their virulence. Over time, he would document evolution in action. Then that would support the idea that the cost... If you have contaminated water allowing transmission, we expect the cholera organism to evolve to a particularly high level of harmfulness, and that's exactly what we see. We find that bacteria that had invaded countries with poor water supplies evolved increased harmfulness over time. They've actually become more toxigenic. They produce more toxin than they did at the outset. If instead we clean up the water supplies, then we force the bacteria to be transmitted only by routes that require healthy people. And what we find is that when cholera invaded countries with clean water supplies, the organism dropped in its harmfulness. Those bacteria evolved lower levels of toxin production. They actually became more mild through time. People would still be getting infected, but the infections would be so mild that most people won't even be sick. So, the cholera outbreak in Latin America suggests that we may need only a few years to change the cholera organism from one that would often kill people to one that hardly ever causes the disease. What we're suggesting here is that we can domesticate these disease organisms very much in the same way that we've domesticated other organisms that are potentially harmful. For example, wolves have been harmful to us throughout our evolutionary history, but through domestication, some wolves have evolved into dogs that instead of harming us, actually help us. And I think we can do the same thing with these disease organisms. Working with evolution instead of against it, we might eventually subdue even the deadliest microbes. Evolution has already forged such surprising truces.